Our second reading today is comprised of two scriptures. The first is from Psalm 40, verses 1 through 11, and the second is from 1 Corinthians, verses 1 through 9. You can follow along in your Bibles or on the screen. Now from Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the desolate pit, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Happy are those who make the Lord their trust, who do not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after false gods. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. Were I to proclaim and tell of them, they would be more than can be counted. Sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, here I am in the scroll of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. See, I have not restrained my lips, as you know, O oh Lord. I have not hidden your saving help within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. Do not, O Lord, withhold your mercy from me. Let your steadfast love and your faithfulness keep me safe forever. And now turning to 1 Corinthians. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Once again, good morning, everyone. My name is Austin Harris. I'm the Director of Worship and Communications here at Topeka First UMC. And it's my joy to be in worship with you this morning and to have an opportunity to share a message of God's love and grace for all of us. I have to admit, despite being the Director of Worship who told Jeff over and over again that our new schedule would work, uh, that I was a little nervous that I'd be the first one not to show up on time. Uh, if you're not familiar with our schedule, I got done preaching at the 1015 service six minutes ago, and so was able to sprint right over. I made it, so no one tell Jeff I, I messed it all up. We're, we're good to go. Um, but that was exciting. Yeah, adrenaline's pumping. Today, we continue our sermon series exploring the unbroken promises that God makes to each and every one of us, to all of creation. And specifically today, we're going to look at God's unbroken promise of faithfulness. God's promise that he will be faithful to us and God's call to be faithful back to God. As followers of God, as Christians, we're called to be faithful people. We know that. But often that's easier said than done. Not because we lack the ability to be faithful, but because often it's easy to get confused about what it means to be faithful people. Right? People like me, jerks like me, who spend too much time reading books and listening to podcasts and overthinking things, have spent thousands of years complicating faithfulness right? to the point that sometimes we're just so confused by what it means we don't even know where to start. To the point that we see things in life and think we have to ignore them 
in order to make our faith make sense. You say, oh, I can't see that pain. I can't see that suffering. I can't feel this way. I, that pastor can't think that thought. This Bible text can't say these words, these contradictions, these confusing things that make me question. I have to ignore them because if I don't, where's my faith? But all of those things assume things about faith that just aren't true because we've done a really good job of muddying the waters. Faith is not a magic lever that we pull. It is not as if followers of God hit this magic moment in their life where suddenly God becomes a cosmic pinata that is raining down answers to prayers and blessings upon them. It's often sold that way. If you have enough faith, then everything you could ever desire will become yours. But that's not how it works. When we step back and reflect, we see that and we know that. Faith is not about getting God to do something for you. And faith is not a password that covers up all the pain and suffering of the world and answers all of our questions. It is not as if when we hit the right level of faithfulness, God sends a passcode to us that we type into a four-digit keypad, and suddenly there is no pain and there is no suffering and everything is perfect in the world. We know that that's not how faith works, but it's so often sold that way. Maybe you've experienced something like this if you're having a hard time in life. You know, you're looking for a job and the opportunities just aren't there and you have no idea what's next for you. Or you've recently lost a loved one or a relationship you really care about is on the skids right now. Maybe finances are a mess or you're just in a funk and you don't know how to get out of it. And so you go to a friend, a confidant, and you're seeking advice and help at the very minimum empathy. But they're just as overwhelmed by your situation as you are. And so all they can muster is, well, have faith. And they mean that with the best of intentions. But if you've been on the receiving end of a have faith, you know it's often not the most helpful answer. Because faith is not just something we quickly speak into existence. Faith is not a magic spell that turns the world into a Disney movie where there is no pain or suffering or doubts or wanderings or questionings. Faith is not a universal solution to the problems of the world. You wondering yet what faith is? I mean, Austin could just spend 40 minutes talking about what faith isn't, but what are we getting at? What is faith? It's funny, as much as we question and doubt and struggle with defining faith, a pretty good answer is given to us right there in the New Testament. It's in the book of Hebrews, which is really more like the longest sermon you've ever read than it is a book. But in it, the author gives us a definition of faith. It's in Hebrews chapter 11, the very first verse. Faith is the reality of what we hope for, the proof of what we don't see. Faith is the reality of what we hope for, the proof of what we do not see. Faith, then, is about going from I hope so to I believe so. Going from I hope so to I know so. Going from I believe this, hope this will be the case, to I am confident that this will be the case. And like most things that we read in Scripture, the answer just creates more questions, right? Namely, how do I know when I've gone from hope to faith, from hope so to know so, to hope so to confident in so? And that feels like a million dollar question, and if you get the answer right, you get to clap your hands and walk out the back door and just skip the rest of church. But it's not really that complicated of a question, right? Think about it for just a second with me. How do you know when something you've hoped for becomes reality. It happens, right? I hope that church gets done on time and Austin stops talking. Austin stops talking and church is done on time. I've gone from hope so to no so because it happened, right? I hope the Chiefs win today. I know the Chiefs have won today. It's 435 and they stopped them, right? From hope so to no so. And how do we go from hope so to confident in so? Well, usually in life it's because someone we trust, someone we care about, someone we believe in has made a promise to us. And we're so confident in their ability to keep their word that we no longer hope it's going to happen, but we have faith that it will happen. When I think of that, I think of my grandfather, who anytime he said something, it was going to be the case. He would move mountains to make sure he followed his word. I didn't hope he was right. I knew 
he was right. I didn't hope he would do something. I knew he would do something. Faith is about going from hope so to know so. Andy Stanley, the pastor of North Point Community Church in the Atlanta, Georgia area, uses a working definition of faith that I find especially helpful. Uh, He says that faith is confidence that God is and that God will do what God promised to do. Faith is confident that God is, confidence that God is God, that God exists, that God is real, and that God will do what God promised to do. I love that definition for a couple of reasons. First, I think it clears up some misconceptions we have. Often, we think that we believe in God because we have faith. But just the opposite is true. If you listen to Andy, he's saying, we have faith because we believe in God. And part two of that I love because it's all about God fulfilling God's promises. And the rest of that Hebrews 11 text is the author going through the long list of reasons why we can believe that because time and time and time and time and time and time again, God has fulfilled God's promises to God's people. He traces it back through the story of the Hebrews, God's chosen people. Their story is preserved for us in the Old Testament today. And he says, look, at how many times God made promises and God kept those promises, why would we doubt that God's going to do what God tells us God is going to do? It goes all the way back to Abraham. Right? God says, Abraham, you're in your 50s. It's time to move out of your mom's basement. You've got to get life going, okay? We've we got to jumpstart things. And so here's what I want you to do, Abraham. I want you to leave your home. I want you to leave everything you know and everything you've ever known. And I want you to follow me into the chosen place that I've picked for you in the desert. And Abraham's got to be going, what? No, I'm, I'm not leaving home I'm, to walk into the desert with you. What are you talking about, God? And God says, if you do that, I'm going to make you a nation. And right there, Abraham's got to be like, what does that even mean? You're going to make me into a nation? Right? Like stick my face on a map? What are we talking about here, God? And he says, Abraham, I'm also going to make your name great. And Abraham's probably going, yeah, that sounds a little bit better. I'd like a great name. And God says, and finally... I'm going to make you and your people a blessing unto all the nations of the world. Now, in that situation, I think I would find any reason not to follow God. I don't want to leave home. I don't want to say goodbye to everything I know. I don't want to follow you into the desert. It's not me, God. I don't have the ability, the capacity, or the will to do that. But Abraham has faith. Faith that God is God and that God will do what God promised Abraham he would do. And so Abraham goes. And not only does Abraham become a nation, he becomes several nations. Nations that define the history not just of the region, but of the world. And 4,000 years later, we're still talking about Abraham. If someone's talking about one of us in the year 6,020, I'd say we have a pretty great name. And, though it took longer than Abraham might have hoped, eventually his descendants do become a great blessing unto all the nations of the world through the ministry and the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. God keeps God's promises. And when we have faith, we're confident in that as an outcome. And God saved the fulfillment of his biggest promise for the end, at least, of that Hebrew story. It was in the year 30 CE that a teacher, a thinker, and a small religious leader was executed in the small city of Jerusalem in the Roman territory of Judah. In the grand scheme of the Roman Empire, this was a nothing event. Rome stretched from Spain to Syria, Egypt to England. They didn't care that one man was executed in one small city in the armpit of the empire. It meant nothing. No royal decree, no breaking news alert, nothing. But out of that great nothing, God created the ultimate something. Through Christ, God fulfilled his promise of faithfulness once and for all in a way that overcomes barriers of language and politics and geography. In a way that lasts for generations, God fulfilled that promise. God did such a great job that it only took 350 years, in the year 380, for Emperor Theodosius, the emperor of that same empire, that couldn't care less that Jesus was executed, to announce that Christianity was the official faith of the empire. And like that, a quarter of the world's population came to know Jesus. And through Jesus, they came to know God. And now 2,000 years later, on every continent, in every corner of the globe, billions of people worship the God 
of love and grace and mercy because they are faithful that God is God and that God keeps God's promises. You don't have to believe it because I say it. You don't have to believe it because Andy Stanley and people far more successful than I say it. I hope you'll believe it because God's proven it to be the case time and time and time again. So what's God's promise for us now? As followers of that Jesus connected to this community in the year 2020 in Topeka, Kansas, what are we supposed to do? Well, the letter that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth that Leslie read for us this morning has some of those answers. The story of Paul is incredible in of itself. Right, because Paul goes from Saul, the hater and persecutor of Christians, a man whose livelihood it was to hunt down Christian communities and make them quietly disappear, to Paul, right, this great evangelist, this man who gives his life in the pursuit of building Christ's kingdom here on earth. He wrote most of our New Testament. He's the most important of the church fathers. And he was so convinced that God was God and God fulfilled God's promises and he gave everything in it. And so he writes these letters to all these early Christian communities, this one to the church in Corinth, Greece. And he starts it in the pretty standard way. From Paul, called by God's will to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, and from Sosthenes, our brother, to God's church that is in Corinth, to those who have been made holy to God in Christ Jesus, who are called to be God's people. Paul's reminding the church in Corinth and us today that we are called through Christ to be God's people. God fulfilled the promise of faithfulness through Christ, and we are called to join God in that faithfulness. We know that because God came and God lived among us, and God did ministry to us, and then God conquered death for us. And in doing so, he built a bridge between us and him that cannot be broken down, cannot be torn down, cannot be blocked off despite our very best efforts. God fulfilled once and for all the reality of his love. Paul continues, Together with all those who call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ in every place, he's their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And I love that Paul highlights here that, that God doesn't just love the people that are already in the club. And he's writing to the church in Corinth, and he says, God does love you, and God does love me, but guess what? God loves everyone. And God wants everyone to know of his grace and his mercy and the blessings that he gives us through Christ. See? I, I got the little chime there. <laughs> now I have no idea where I was. That, you know, a little cosmic interference. Paul continues, I thank God always for you because of God's grace that was given to you in Christ Jesus. That is, you were made rich through him in everything, in all your communication and in every kind of knowledge, in the same way that the testimony of Christ was confirmed with you. The result is, you aren't missing any spiritual gift while you wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. Paul says, guess what, guys? Through Christ, you have everything. All the gifts, all the skills, all the knowledge, all the abilities you will ever need to have in order to be in relationship with God, you've got them given to you free of charge through Christ Jesus. What a gift that is. Right? He tees up the big promise that God has promised through Christ that we have everything. Paul says, can you believe in that promise? Just as everyone before us has believed in the promise that God makes. Can we have faith that God too will fulfill this? Okay, Paul, that's all fine and good. We've got all these great gifts and skills and abilities. I'm very grateful to have them, but what's the point of them? What's God want us to do with them? Well, don't try to trick Paul. He usually has the answers. He says, God is faithful. What a great reminder. Right? And they're in the middle of it all. God is faithful. And you were called by him to partnership with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Right? Paul says God has given you everything you need. All the skills, all the abilities, all the knowledge, all the power, God's given it to you. And God promises that now you are partners with his son, Jesus Christ, to do what Jesus Christ says we are to do. And what's Jesus say in his last moments with the disciples? He says, go. Therefore, 
and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says to us, his partners in ministry, empowered by God to accomplish all things that God wants us to accomplish, to go and share the message of love and grace and mercy with all those around us. It was faith in that knowledge that convicted the early church leaders to give their lives in pursuit of the building of God's kingdom. It's conviction in that knowledge that over 2,000 years has allowed so many people to come to know the God that cares for them, that has transformed societies in incredible ways. And I'm left now wondering, what would it look like if we chose to live convicted in that knowledge the way those before us did? What would it look like if we were so confident that God was going to fulfill God's promise that we went and we baptized people of all the nations? What would it look like if we saw people who didn't yet know the love and the grace of God and invited them to know a new way of living? What if we were confident in our abilities to transform the world, to make it more just, to make it more equitable, to make it more fair, to bring a piece of heaven to Topeka, Kansas in the year 2020? What would it look like if we were faithful enough to say that God is God and God is going to keep God's promise? And God's promise to us is that together with him, we can transform the world. How do we know all of that? Well, Paul answers in another letter, this one to the church in Rome. He says, God shows his love for you. Because while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So now that we have been made righteous by his blood, we can be even more certain that we will be saved from God's wrath through him. If we were reconciled to God through the death of his son while we were still enemies, now that we have been reconciled, how much more certain is it that we will be saved by his life? And not only that, we even take pride in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, the one through whom we now have a restored relationship with God. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And in so doing, God fulfilled his promise of faithfulness. He proved once and for all that there's not a promise that God will make that God will break. So can we have confidence in that? Can we leave here today knowing that God loves us? God loves you. God chooses you. And God gives you gifts and skills to use in the building of God's kingdom. Yes, even you are empowered by God to transform the world. Will you pray with me? Loving and gracious God, we come here today in a world so in need. We see a world of pain and suffering and darkness. And God... We seek to be reminded that through you, we've been given everything we need to transform that world. God, might you empower us and help us to be your light shining in the darkness. Might you remind us of the skills and the abilities you have granted each and every one of us as your precious creation. And God, might we go from this place and do our part to build your kingdom here and now. It's in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.